just talked about how to use the commands in Pester, how to create a test script and things. And people seem to get it. Uh, got a lot of good positive response from that session. Um, and people started to send me questions about their tests to, you know, have ideas for, for how to write them and things. And what I noticed is that people weren't having a hard time so much with the Pester module itself, like the, the commands and the syntax and things like that, where their, their problems tended to be was in how to choose in what tests to write. So they'd be looking at their code and they'd, they'd start writing tests that didn't have a lot of value or, or didn't even know where to start and weren't writing tests at all. And I thought that would make a good follow-up presentation is um, to take some real-world code instead of just some contrived example that I made up um, and go through how we choose what tests to write and how to um, come up with you know a suite of tests that is, gives you pretty good coverage and value. It doesn't have to be necessarily 100%. But, um, so to do that, I'm going to go through two modules uh, that I've written and have written the tests for to demonstrate some different approaches to these uh, to test, different types of tests that you can write. And then if there's time, um, I asked for submissions on some code that I could write tests for live uh, so we could go through and look at this code. And it's, it's a fairly small function. It's only 38 lines. Um, but we'll look through that and say, well, well, we'll fill in this blank file here. Um, so to start with, there's there's really two types of tests that I tend to use Pester for. Um, and keep in mind that this presentation is, is my own approach. That it, It's not necessarily right for everybody. Um, and there's certainly more things you could do with Pester. But I tend to categorize my tests into two, two buckets. There's the unit tests, which is where I take a particular single function and thoroughly test its inputs and outputs, and I try to isolate it from every other function as best I can. Um, and so I'm, I'm only looking at the logic in that single function. And then there's what I refer to as acceptance tests, but um, you know whether it totally fits that definition is, is uh, doesn't really matter. But in an acceptance test, I just run a command, like I set up an environment run the command live without doing any isolation or mocking or things like that, and then test the state that it created. So um, if I've got a command that, for example, creates a file on disk, I'll just point my test to, to run that command and create a file on disk, and then I'll analyze the file. And so I haven't done any any mocking or anything. I'm, I'm running all of the code in its entirety. Um, and these are both useful and, and both valid types of tests. Um, unit tests tend to be easier to run wherever you are because you've isolated them from stuff. They don't, they're not going to make changes to your system. They're not going to rely on you know, databases or web services or whatever that might have to be up for your code to normally work, but they still test your logic. So it's, it's always a good idea to have um, some unit tests if, if you want to be able to test anywhere, even offline. Um, but acceptance tests are a good thing to have even if you already have unit tests because sometimes unit tests are not enough when you take all your different individual functions, even though they all seem to work in a vacuum, and you stick them together. Um, you know, maybe you get values from, let's say, your database that weren't quite what you expected. So your code, you know, tests correctly because you wrote tests according to your assumptions, but the actual data is different, or you know, the web service protocol is slightly different than what you expected, that sort of thing. Um, so to start, I'm going to look at what I would consider to be some unit tests in one of my modules here. Um, and a really good place to find this type of tests, in, in my experience, is a DSC resource. Um, DSC resources tend to be just wrappers around other PowerShell commands or functions. So Ideally, those other commands that you're creating a DSC resource around should already be tested and trusted, and you, you know that if you call these commands a certain way, what the outcome is going to be. And you just want to make sure that the logic in your DSC resource, the, this, the code that makes it idempotent and the code that um, calls the commands under the, the right, uh, with the right parameters and in the right situations, is correct. And so to do that sort of thing, um, that's where I would tend to use mocking in Pester. So this uh, this DSC resource here is, th there's not much in this file, but I wanted to open it first just to show you that what's happening here is I've got a, 
I've got two different DSC resources that actually have almost exactly the same code with the only difference being what gets passed in for this path parameter. So in this case, my, uh, my DSC resource happens to use this get pull file path with a policy type parameter to get the path and then it calls the common get and same thing over here, the common set and the common test. So we don't need to look at this file anymore other than to remember get pull file path because that's the, uh, that's going to come up. So we'll go over and look at the common functions then. And here is the get policy file, policy file path and the other DSC resources uses account. So if we uh, look at this, it just gets to the well-known locations of the uh, uh, registry.pol files that are part of the local group policy object, which is what this module runs. And now to the really interesting stuff. So let's start with get target resource because it tends to be simpler than the other two. Um, we've got here a function that calls three other PowerShell commands. We've got test path, we've got another function in my module called parse key value name, and we've got get policy file entry. Now, of the three, test path is a well-known thing. We know exactly how that works. And get policy file entry is in this same module, but for the purposes of testing the DSC resource, I'm treating this as a command that I know works because it's already got its own tests and I'm not concerned with whether or not get policy file entry behaves the way it's supposed to when I'm just testing the logic of the DSC resource. So what's going to happen in my test is I'm going to mock these so that when the DSC resource calls get policy file entry, it just gets back what I want to give it in order to test the rest of the logic. Um, and the same thing with test path. Um, I'm either going to create a file on disk and just give it that path, or I'm going to mock test path to return true either way. Uh, parse key value name, that's actually a very simple function. I don't think I need to be concerned with testing that so much, but, uh, but we'll see, because I don't remember what I wrote. So here's the tests. <laughs> so we'll go into the get target resource, because that's what we just looked at, and we'll see what we've got here. So first of all, yes, I am mocking test path to just return true anytime it's looking for a uh, registry.pol file anywhere in system32 group policy, which will cover all of the uh, all of the possible paths that might come out. This way, even if I run my unit tests on a system that doesn't have a local group policy object or doesn't have any administrative template settings defined, my test will still run. Uh, and in fact, this wasn't originally there when I ran my unit tests on a, uh, on a build server, they were failing, which seems silly, but that turned out to be the problem. I forgot to mock test path. Um, and then under here, I've got just various different contexts for uh, the types of situations that might be in effect when I call get target resource. So I set up some parameters here. Here is my mock to get policy file entry. So in this case, um, when the value is present, so I have it return some, some mock data that I want it to have. I call get target resource with both of those mocks in play. So again, if I go back and look over here, we know that test path is going to return true, which means we'll run the rest of this code. Uh, parse key value name is, is not a big deal. I mean, I, I could unit test that or whatever, but it should just work fine. And then when it calls get policy file entry, it's going to get back my mock object here. And then it should put all of these things into the, uh, the hash table that gets returned with the proper key names. So in this case, ensure should be set to present type and data just come from the uh, get policy file entry function and over here we validate that so we get our hash table we say that the I could even check the type I could say hash table dot get type should be hash table but um, I didn't do that in this case I just said there should be five keys in my hash table this is how you uh, how you do that safely with a hash table object so that even if it happens to have a key that is named count when you do psbase.count, you're getting the number of elements in the hash table. And then all five of those should be the values we expect. That's small, that's easy, but that very clearly demonstrates what I mean by a unit test. By, by using these two mocks to isolate 
the code in the, the logic that's in this function from the logic that's in test path and in get policy file entry. I don't have to have any other special considerations on the system. I can run that test on anything that runs PowerShell. I, you know, if we get PowerShell on Linux, I might even be able to unit test it there. <laughs> so we'll go on to one of the more complicated functions here. Uh, set target resource probably being the the most uh, the most complicated. So again, I'm going to mock test path to true because we we want the same thing to happen. We want to uh, let's see here. Okay, the the calls to test path must be down in uh, in set policy file entry, but that's okay. I I would have duck down a little bit to uh, to get to the same place. And here, notice I've I've mocked set policy file entry and remove policy file entry, which are the two uh, commands that again we're treating as known and trusted. We don't actually care for the purposes of this unit test whether or not these two functions behave well or not. We know how they're supposed to behave if we give them the proper uh, sets of parameters. So in the test here, I just mock those out to do nothing. If you call the mock command in pester and you don't give it a, a script block to, to implement it all, it just defaults to an empty script block with no commands. And the reason that I do that is one, so that I don't actually try to modify my, uh, my computer wherever I happen to be running the tests, and two, so that I can use the assert mock called command which, uh, and give it a parameter filter which tells me whether or not the um, the parameters that were passed to the command match what I expect them to be. So when I call set target resource with this type and this uh, key value name, ensure data and type, it should call set policy file entry and it should not call remove policy file entry. And then same thing down here. When I set it to absent, then it should call remove and it should not call set. So. Um, this is actually a pretty simple DSC resource because it's a wrapper around a fairly simple set of uh, commands, but it gives you hopefully a, a clear idea of what I mean when I say unit tests and what I mean when I say I use mocking to isolate my code from the rest of it. So I'm writing a test. I only want to know if the logic that's in this function is okay or not. Um, excuse me. Okay, um, notice what I didn't do here, and I could have done, I didn't do any error testing. So I uh, the, I really only tested sort of the, the happy path, um, which is good. Um, that, that covers, you know, probably at least 75% of the, the tests that you need to write at any given time. But I didn't try to pass in any invalid uh, sets of stuff and tell it that it should, um, produce those errors. I, I could have done because I've got this data and type um, assertion here. And if I look down here, okay, so if you pass in an array and you're not using one of the types that uh, support arrays of values, then it gives you a uh, an error. So I could have tested that. I didn't. Maybe now that I've pointed that out to myself, I'll go back and write that test later. But um, but it's okay. I've, I've still demonstrated the, the use of mocking here. So the other type of test that I mentioned earlier was an acceptance test where I don't use mocking probably at all or very little and I just run the code to see what happens. So uh, a good example of that is my protected data module which is um, uh, protected data is an encryption module so all of the tests in here, let's say, it doesn't really matter, um, tend to run commands in pairs. So I run protect data to produce the encrypted representation of some piece of data, whether it's a string or a uh, PS credential or whatever. There's, there's tests around all those scenarios. And then I run unprotect data with different sets of, uh, of parameters and 
I'm either looking for it to throw um, errors in situations where it's supposed to throw errors, or I'm looking for it to decrypt the uh, the value successfully back to its original thing here. So if I look down and what, one thing you'll tend to notice is um, when I'm writing unit tests, if I look over here, I will tend to have d either describes or context with the name of a function. It doesn't have to be that way, but this is a pretty good indicator to me that if I want that to be my describe or my context, then I should be isolating that function and writing tests just against that. When I'm writing acceptance tests, I tend to write describe and context that are um, describing the conditions under which the code is running. So it might say, you know, when the server's online or, or whatever. Um, in this case, my contexts are making sure that I can encrypt and decrypt different types of uh, input objects successfully. So to make sure that I get back a PS credential or a secure string and that it has the right value. Uh, so in here, I will run my protect data with no mocking, just encrypt this with this certificate and I've got some um, some test certificates both stored in my repository and uh, also generated on the fly by my uh, by my, my module here um, so here I've got yeah okay here's my my test certificates that are in my my source code repository and then I try to decrypt it and um, if this happens to throw an error, it will, I, I didn't use like a should not throw here, but I could have done, and it's probably not a bad idea, but um, I just encrypt the value, decrypt it, and then make sure that it is returning a string and that it's the right value. And then same thing down here for secure strings, encrypt it, decrypt it, see that it is a secure string and that it uh, has the right value. So I've got a a function in my test file for uh, converting a secure string back to text. PS credential, it's, you know, same thing, except now I'm checking the username and the password. So these tests have no mocks whatsoever, and they're they're not a very targeted type of test. You know, I'm, I'm saying whatever logic is in protect data and unprotect data, just run it, and all I want to do is look at the results. Um, if I were doing this with a DSC resource, I would probably create a new VM, either, you know, in, in Azure or in Vagrant or whatever, however I wanted to do that, create a DSC configuration that uses my resource, apply it to the system, and then my pester tests. So all that stuff might be up here in my sort of initialization section outside of any describes. And then in my pester tests, I would start to check the state of the system. So in the, in the other module here where I was... Uh, messing with the, the local group policy object, I would um, go ahead and start to look at the values in that local GPO and make sure that they matched what the DSC configuration said it was an acceptance test. You can use Pester to test things that aren't even PowerShell. Um, you might have uh, not even .NET code. So you, you might have a web service that you wrote in PHP and you deploy it and it's on a web server and then you just write some pester tests that might be written around using uh, invoke web request or invoke rest method to make sure that your web service behaves the way it's supposed to. When you give it this set of arguments, you get back these values. So I, I really like using pester for this type of test, even if I'm not testing PowerShell code, because it's, it's so easy to, to use pester and it's so easy to use PowerShell as this glue language that can interface with practically anything. Um, it, it becomes a unit test framework for just about anything, or maybe not a unit test, but a test framework for just about anything. Uh, so that's uh, that's the example that I have here for tests without mocking. Like if, if I search here, there's not a single call to mock anywhere in this protected data test file because everything that it does is just pairs of encrypt and decrypt steps to make sure that it works when it's supposed to and it doesn't work when it's not supposed to. And we actually got through that pretty quick. So, um, Nicholas, do you want to pass on any questions before I go to writing tests around the uh, the submission that I got? That was actually one of the things I forgot to mention. Um, anybody, if you have any questions, we have a, um, a questions feature. Um, you guys request them, and I will voice them over to Dave. We do not have any at the moment, Dave. 
Okay, great. Um, so what I did, I, I went out to Twitter um, with uh, as I was thinking about how to, to do this presentation, and I said, one of the things that, that might be valuable is if I took a, an unfamiliar piece of code, you know, to, if somebody were to submit a function, and I would read that code and come up with tests for it. Um, and that way, you could see the process of deciding what what types of tests to write and what tests are important. So the submission that I got, let me just uh, double check who that came from here. This came from Neil. Wait, no, sorry. Ah, Tim, Tim Pringle sent me this. And uh, it's just a, a quick little function that he wrote for giving a PowerShell wrapper around the, the tiny URL web service. And uh, it's nice because it's got a few different branches here. It's got some one, two, three if statements um, and a little bit of logic that we can test. Um, so with that, I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and do an acceptance style test because there's there's really not much happening. Um, th there's not much logic here. I mean, you know, the, the if statements are based around reading and writing to the clipboard, and that's not terribly exciting. And everything else that happens is out in a web service. So I'm not going to do any mocking here. I'm just going to write some tests that that work as is. So first thing I'm going to do, I've got a completely empty file here, is I need to, because I've, I've put this into a PSM1 file, I need to make sure that the module is imported. So I'm going to do um, I tend to write my, my tests and my code in general to be compatible with PowerShell version 2. And PowerShell version 2 does not have an error action ignore uh, parameter. So this is kind of a neat little trick of sticking the G or whatever letter you want in square brackets. Remove module will no longer throw an error if there are no modules loaded that match that pattern because now it sees this as a pattern containing wildcards instead of this. So watch this. If I run this as is, you get remove module throws an error. And if I do it like this, remove module throws no error. It's kind of neat. Um, as a just a way of not polluting the, the dollar error variable or, uh, or having error stream output creep in. I, I could have also done it as error action silently continue. That would still put stuff into my dollar error variable, so I like to use this trick. But if you're writing code that is PowerShell version 3 or later and you don't care about v2, this works just as well, the, the error action ignore. So I'll leave it like that for now. And then I'm going to do import module. And since I'm going with uh, PowerShell version 3 stuff, I'll go ahead and use PS script root. All right. And then I will. Um, in this case, even though I'm doing an acceptance style test, and I said if I, if I use the function name, th there's nothing else to test here. So <laughs> that's just going to be the name of my describe. And, well. Let's just start with that, and I'll clean up stuff later. So just for giggles here, I'm going to go out to tinyurl, uh, the website. And I'm not sure. I think you can see this. So we'll go out to, and let's go for powershell.org. Let's go HTTP. All right. So that is PowerShell.org. And I'm going to say in my test here, get tiny URL dash URI. And whoops. see that it returns, so, okay, it, ret it returns a PowerShell custom object that contains both the URI that you're fetching and the tiny URL representation. So I'll say result.uri should be, uh, I'll fill that in a second because I don't want to overwrite my clipboard yet, result.tiny. 
tiny URL. So we've got that. This should be this. And we'll try just running this as is. This this probably should work. Um, There we go, cool. So it took a while to get out to tinyurl and to actually return the value. And one thing that you uh, might, I, I like to do this every now and then, I like to see my tests fail to make sure that I haven't just done something silly. So I just tacked on an extra character to the expected tinyurl and that way, um, you know, we know that it didn't pass the test just because I did something stupid, it passed the test because it actually got back the right value. Oh, Dave, we actually have a couple questions. Sure. Uh, first one is, um, uh, do you ever write your tests first and then write a function? Sometimes. Um, I, I haven't really been that good at getting into the test-driven development mindset where you, you have that little, uh, what do they call it, red-green refactor, um, except in one, one case, and that's where I'm doing a bug fix. So if somebody logs an issue out on GitHub and if they gave me reproduction code even better, but I take that reproduction code or I debug the problem and figure out what's wrong and I put the, the reproduction of that bug into a test case first and that way, again, I can see the test fail and that way I know that when I change the code to fix the bug, I know that it's fixed. Um, that tends to work much better for me than fixing the bug first because then I have to go back and unfix the bug to make sure that the test would have failed. So I've I've gotten myself into the the habit of doing that for bug fixes. When it comes for when it comes to um, general development, like if I look at um, protected data, there's uh, most of the most of the stuff is in commands.ps1. There's 2,500 lines of code here, and what seems to work for me when I'm thinking of test-driven development, I can do that type of thing where I know ahead of time the function that I want to write, what its input should be, what its output should be, and how it should behave. If I had that picture in my head already before I started writing the function, then I could write the test first because the tests are sort of the specification for it. But I tend to write code when I'm doing it from scratch, sort of from the outside in. So I think of the, uh, out here, like the protect data command, how it should generally behave based on the inputs that I give it and, and what outputs I expect to get. But I'm going to have to break this function down into lots and lots of little helper functions that, you know, I, I don't have 2,500 lines worth of, of clear picture in my head when I start that. So I could start by writing some tests, but it would take so long to make those tests pass that it's almost not worth it. Um, whereas if, you, if you're in a situation where you can start by writing very small pieces of code and then put them all together later, so you're writing code in sort of this inside out approach as opposed to what I described as outside in, then test driven development would work fine for me. But my brain doesn't think that way and I just I haven't found it to be very useful for me. Got it. Um, that being said, I definitely see the, the benefits of test-driven development, which are you're almost just about guaranteed to have 100% test coverage because you've, <laughs> you haven't written any lines of code that weren't already tested and failing before you wrote the code. So um, if, you, if you can figure out how to make your brain work that way, then it saves you from writing, say, a 2,500-line module and then sitting there and groaning because now you have to go back and write tests for your 2500 line module. <laughs> right. Oh, we have another question. Uh, do you sure. leave test code in the production? Uh, and is it a good practice to have the test code run every time a function runs in production? Okay. Um, I assume by in production what you mean is when you distribute your code. So. Um, no, I don't. I, I tend to have build scripts that run after my tests run. So on a either like an app there or a team city um, CI continuous integration server. Um, once my tests pass, then I produce the um, the distributable distributable version of the module, which strips out all of the test stuff. So I can show you for um, for protected data. I've got this build script that takes out all of the test certificates and uh, 
the build script itself and um, and that sort of thing and it produces a version of the module that is as small as I can make it because some of my t I mean th this one is all just little test files but like I've got a DSC resource over here um, let's see team city build yeah this is the one um, all right so let's do it this way I've got a looks like about 12 or 13 megabyte zip file that is needed in my test because um, normally this this file or a version of it gets downloaded from a web server but when I run my unit tests I just mock that uh, invoke web request call to copy the, the version of this build agent.zip that I have in my source code repository I don't want to distribute a 12 megabyte uh, PowerShell module or you know publish a 12 megabyte PowerShell module out to uh, out to NuGet or whatever when really all they need is the uh, 20 kilobytes of script code that's there so so, um, so, you, so pretty I, much, you pretty much run your tests whenever you change your code not yes. really at runtime correct yeah. um, and uh, you know I guess if you were going to try to run your tests in production what you would probably be looking for is either environmental stuff that you didn't test before, so things that might fail um, sort of sporadically, like if a web service goes down or things like that, or you're making sure that nobody's changed your code. And I think that there's probably better ways to do that. Um, in particular, you could use digital signatures and have a, you know, an execution policy of all signed or whatever in your uh, in whatever task is kicking off that code. And that way, if, if anybody changes the code, the signature's invalid, and and that's that. So, right. Right. Uh, and yeah, I, the other thing is that if you were going to keep your tests in production and have it run before the live code runs, then you'd also be taking a dependency on deploying Pester onto all your production systems, which might be really convenient when Windows 10 is out and it has Pester anyway, but for the most part, I'm, I'm putting Pester on development machines and not everywhere. Cool. All right. Um, so we'll go back over here. And that's actually... Uh, <laughs> as far as the, the simple happy path, I mean, I could put in some other test cases, other URLs and, and other values and make sure that they worked, but unless well actually here, here's a good example let's let's take a URL that's got a um, some funny characters and let's do let's say what what's a, a good example so we'll go to powershell.org I'm just I'm gonna find something that's got like some oh wow well darn it we've got a well-behaved thing here that's not using you know like topic equals whatever so I'm gonna find a different website um, let's uh, kb.microsoft.com I think that will do oh it's support.microsoft.com KB. oh you know what actually Google here we go. This Google search that'll do. That's got some weird characters. So let's go back over to tiny URL. And stick that in there. And actually, I'm not going to copy that yet. So the URI is you know let's put that in a single variable because I don't want to have to do that twice. Okay, and the tiny URL, and what this will do is make sure that if by chance, I, I haven't even tested this, so I don't know if it's going to work or not, but I noticed that this is just passing my dollar URI directly to the uh, to invoke web requests, so there's no um, HTML or HTTP escaping going on, and maybe there needs to be, so this might be a unit test that, that reveals a bug, or it might just work. So let's go here, and again, I like to see my test fail, so I'm going to do that first. And 
actually it looks like it worked because it's only complaining about that one little extra character. So it looks like we don't need to worry about escaping URLs, at least based on the question mark and ampersand and all the kind of characters that are in this particular one. Um, I don't know, we could try other URLs like with percent, uh, with, with actual URL escapes and things like that, but this, this is pretty good as a starting point for the test. Uh, so the other bits of logic in here are this read clipboard and write clipboard switch that it has. Um, okay, so write clipboard is a member of both parameter sets, okay. Um, the tricky part here is that these are using .NET static methods. Um, you can't mock those, you can't verify that they were called, so we could do this one of two ways. We could either set the clipboard um, out in the test code, run this with dash read clipboard, and then make sure that it, it did it, so like a, an acceptance test using the clipboard, or I could wrap these calls to this .NET stuff in the PowerShell function, and I'm going to do that just to demonstrate that that can sometimes be useful, so, and in fact, PowerShell version 5, which I'm running, actually has clipboard commandlets, but I'm going to pretend they don't exist for the, the purposes of demonstration here. So I'm going to say that There we go. Uh, and I, you know what, I'll even call these text to, to call out what they are because the clipboard can do other stuff, but we're hard coding system.string in both cases. So we'll do that. And then up here we'll say equals read clipboard text. And that's that. Down here, set clipboard text text tiny URL, and this way, now I can mock read clipboard text and set clipboard text and, uh, and isolate my code from this .NET class, the system.windows.forms.clipboard. So either one of those approaches will work. I'm actually going to write test both ways just to show that, you know, you've got some flexibility there. Um, the clipboard is there on every Windows system, so I might not really worry about mocking in a, in a live test because I'm fine with reading and writing the clipboard, but if instead of the clipboard this was going off to a SQL database or to Active Directory or something, then there might be some value in, in using the mocking uh, because you don't want your test to fail just because your database happens to be unreachable or you've got a network problem or something like that. That doesn't actually reveal a problem with your code, which is the important thing that the test should be telling you. Um, but on the other hand, like I pointed out earlier, except in tests, there could be problems in the assumptions that your code makes about the database. So if your tests would fail when the database is up, it's still a good thing to know. So maybe you want both kinds of tests, and that's why I'll go ahead and write both here, even though the clipboard is, is simple enough that it doesn't really matter. So um, let's do context board traction. This, this doesn't have to be in a context. I just I like to group similar tests that way so that uh, it, it shows up nice down in the in the output. I'm going to say okay. So now I'm going to use the PowerShell commandlets to interact with the clipboard. So I'm going to say set clipboard uh, value. We'll just stick with the PowerShell.org stuff. because we already know those values are good, just out of habit. I'm removing some of the duplicated stuff there. Um, all right, so I'm going to grab this, produce it down here, and then I'm going to say result equals get tiny URL read clipboard, and then I will use the exact same 
assertions as with the PowerShell.org code up there. And this should hopefully just work. Yep, there we go. And again, if I want to see the test fail, I just stick a little extra tag onto my string there. And here is Um, so I'm going to do mock dash module name. Uh, what did I call this? Just get tiny URL. Uh, command is read clipboard text, I think. Yes. Turn. Yeah, just stick with the, the URL I've already got. And then we'll say. Um, yeah, that's fine. Actually, I'm going to do something a little bit different here, and I'll explain why in a second. I'm going to move this into its own describe. And this way I can have context to control the, uh, the lifetime of my mocks. Because even though I'm doing a mock in the it block here, it would actually be alive for the entire either context or describe that contains it. So. Um, so by doing this, I can make sure that um, those mocks only exist in the, the bits of code that I want to. You could also just be careful and write your tests in the proper order, but it's, uh, it's a good idea to make sure that, that your mocks are in either a describer or a context so that they're not left lying around and screw with other tests that you write later. Um, so I'm going to say... So we're going to say result equals get tiny URL dash URL dash right clipboard. And let's see how this works. So it, okay, it still returns the object, but it also writes the, the tiny URL to the clipboard. So we'll test for both. So we'll say, should be that, and get clipboard dash, I don't actually know how the get clipboard works here, yeah, text, that's fine. That should work. Yep, cool. Again, I like to see my test fail. Cool. And then the last thing to do is the mocked version of the so I'm going to say and this one I'm not going to give it an implementation this is whenever you're mocking a, a set style command or remove or something that modifies something what I'm actually doing here is I'm telling it to do nothing, but then using a cert mock called, I can verify that it was called with the parameters that I expected it to. So here I'm going to grab my code uh, here. That should be right clipboard. Oh, you know what? This is what I want. Copied the wrong one. There we go. And so that's all good. And then assert not called module get set clipboard text dash parameter filter and the text parameter should be equal to the tiny URL. Again, we're all green. If I fiddle with that again, we should see some red. Excellent. So that is pretty much all the tests that, uh, that this little function should need, um, unless you wanted to do some error handling. But there's not really any, any errors um, that could happen here, except maybe if the, the web service couldn't be reached. So I wouldn't worry about that. But if you had some uh, some parameter validation or 
you know, some, some code in here that threw an error, you might want to write some tests around those cases to make sure that it throws errors in the expected uh, situations and not in others. Do well, we have any more questions? I was just going to say we have, we have a few more questions. Um, uh, ben is asking, uh, how would you validate um, WMF5 class behavior in Pester? He's wondering about DSC resource, class-based resources uh, and classes in general. Yep. That's, uh, that's kind of still to be determined. Um, there's, you, can, um, you can validate the code inside a class. So I'm going to try to just whip something up real quick here. So I'm going to say class demo and uh, we'll give it a string property, just call it property, and we'll give it a method. Um, we'll just say, oh, what am I doing wrong? And property length. Um, you can tell I haven't started using PowerShell v5 classes yet. So. I, I think you not, have to. Oh, return. Not, not all code paths return a value. Okay, good. Um, so we'll say return this dot property dot length. There we go. So that's pretty simple. Um, although actually, it's not good enough. Um, well, it, it, it's okay. So. We'll do this. Now, the, the other thing is that um, I'm not sure where classes stand in terms of being able to use them outside of the file in which they're they're declared. So for now, I'm going to put the class definition and the uh, the pester test right in the same file just to make sure that there's no goofiness happening there. Um, not something that I would normally do, but all right. So. Um, And let's see here. So that's a 14 character string. So we'll say, oops. So, I mean, this is a simple kind of test. This is an acceptance type of test where you can instantiate your, oops, uh, I should put that into a, it blocks, so it actually shows up. There we go. Um, what's still a challenge to figure out is mocking. So, um, like, I couldn't say mock dollar demo dot property length because it is a dot net um, method, and Pester's mocking only supports mocking PowerShell commandlets and functions and Technically, there's a little bit of support for mocking calls to ex external executables, but it doesn't behave very well, so I never use it. Um, there is no support whatsoever for mocking calls to a .NET class method or object method, um, and that's something that we need to figure out if, if we need to support this in PowerShell version 5 comes out, how the heck we're going to do it. Um, Joel Bennett Jekyll has mentioned that there's a, a framework out there called Rhino Mocks which is very useful for being able to generate um, new objects that have mock implementations and stuff, but you still then have to be able to get that mock object somehow into your code so that calls are made to that instead of to whatever object there is. So um, in C Sharp or any other full-blown uh, object-oriented language, programmers are in the habit of writing code that is easily testable. So you use a, a technique called dependency injection, where instead of your um, instead of having a bit of code that creates a new demo object, it accepts as input um, an object of generally of type of an interface that demo would implement, and that way um, your production code might be using this actual demo class, but your test code might be using some mocked up thing, and because it accepts that object as a, an input using this dependency injection, it's very easy to test. When you have code that creates new instances of objects or is um, what they call tightly coupled or tightly bound to some specific implementation, it's very hard to test. And now PowerShell 
is going to be in this boat. People are either going to have to accept that they can't really test with, with mocking in the same way that they could before, or we're going to have to start learning to write testable code in the same way that a C-sharp developer would. I don't know exactly what direction that's going to go yet. Um, and it could be another option because Microsoft is, is taking an interest in Pester. Maybe they will give us some engine hooks that will allow us to, to mock um, static or object.NET methods, and that way we could just, you know, it's, it's not something that we could do with, with what's in PowerShell today, but we could have something in the engine that says when it tries to resolve this .NET method, and we could somehow inject something that says if it's trying to call the um, property length method on this dollar demo object, run this code instead. And if they can do that for us, then it becomes very easy. So I'm going to have to remember to ask them for that because <laughs> it's 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 not an easy uh, problem to solve. I mean, Pester, the entire module, I think is only something like 10,000 lines of code, and uh, I don't know how that compares to something like NUnit or uh, or Microsoft Fakes or whatever, but I think that it gets much much harder when you have to try to start jamming code into the the .NET runtime instead of uh, just living out in the PowerShell world. All right, and I think we're we're coming up to the end of the time, so just one last question, Dave. Uh, sure. They want a war story. How has Pester helped you in your daily job? Any success stories where a tragedy was subverted? <laughs> Okay. Um, hmm. War stories. Investors help me in my daily job. I don't know. I, I mean, I use it on a daily basis because I I have this continuous delivery uh, pipeline that we set up for um, for our customers, and they use DSC resources, custom resources that that I've written or that I've downloaded from PowerShell.org and things like that, or from Microsoft. Um, I can't think of a specific like. Ooh, Pester save the day, you know, <laughs> wipe the sweat off my brow kind of moment off the top of my head. But Right, because you're using um, it properly, right? You're setting up all your tests before it could get you in trouble. Yeah, it's it's certainly like I've had builds fail, and I've had to look at my test and figure out what went wrong, and sometimes the builds failed because my tests were wrong. Um, but that's good. I, I want the build to fail and give me something to do more than I want it to succeed and allow bad code to actually go off and fail in production. So, um, you know, anytime Pester throws an error and, and my build fails means it's doing its job. All right. Well, I think that's it. Uh, Dave, I'd like to thank you for coming. Um, the next uh, tech session we're going to offer is on Git. It's going to be by uh, Warren Frame. And I look forward to, uh, you know, everybody registering for that one as well. Uh, thanks again, Dave. Great. Take care. Bye.